I'm Scott Al Miller. This is my vlog of daily life living in Leon, Nicaragua, where it's really dangerous and you shouldn't come. I mean, it's okay for me and all, but you, you should really think twice because it, it wouldn't be safe for you. Oddly, this is something a lot of people hear. The combination of it's great, I've chosen it, it definitely is the place I want to live, but you know you would be, you'd be, no, it wouldn't be good for you. This is way too common, and I had someone who asked me about someone who told them exactly this just recently, but that's not really the point. I have a lot of people with exact same messages sent to them on a regular basis, so I think this is something we need to talk about because everyone's getting the same story and we can dive into the logic and maybe some history on it all together and take care of this for everyone. So let's get to that right after the bump. Gorgeous Friday afternoon here in Leon, Nicaragua. Before we dive into everything that we're going to cover today, I, I want to set a little bit of context because this is going to be really important as we go throughout this talk, but we're going to get to the very specific thing that people are being told pretty quickly. A number of years ago, there was a number of protests going on that to some degree erupted into some small amount of violence. Not a huge thing, but violence is bad. And that caused the government to respond as the violence was against the government. And people started calling to bring down the government or to stop the existing processes and, and reset the government, start a new government. There's a lot of different ways to frame it. And of course, in anything where you have a protest or violent protest or an insurrection even, you, you don't have, in really any case, an absolute singular voice to those things. So what people want, what they're calling for may have a general similarity, but it, it's going to be a little bit different depending on who you talk to, who you witness, uh, and, and what people think that they're there representing. And that caused a lot of problems because anytime that you have a group of people looking to overthrow a government, you have another group of people that that is the government that they wanted to have in place and, and whatever process they went through, put it there. Uh, and so you have people at odds. And so it becomes a really big thing, right? You, you don't just have an uprising against the government as if, as if it's an isolated entity. Uprisings are against the government and all of the people in the population who put it there and all the people who just want to follow the existing processes regardless of whether or not it's the government that represents them or not. And then afterwards you have to deal with what do you do with people who are involved in a violent uprising? Do you arrest them? Do you charge them? Do you forgive them? Do you deport them? What do you do? Now of course I'm talking in this context about the United States. This happened in 2021, and we all know that the United States is going through a dark night of the soul where the country itself is trying to decide is armed uprisings and the attempt to overthrow the government something that we hate or put up with or even want? And is it something that the freedom of speech, as is preached in the United States, is going to protect the calls for insurrection? Because traditionally it is assumed, and throughout most of the world, even when you have freedom of speech, which many countries, France, for example, don't believe is a good thing and do not allow, but even in countries that have freedom of speech, you're generally not allowed to use that freedom to cry fire in a uh, movie theater that there isn't really a fire. You're not allowed to use it to harm people. You're not allowed to use it to be dishonest. You're not allowed to use it to attempt to overthrow the government. You can't commit crimes by using freedom of speech. In most cases, the United States is debating whether they want the freedom of speech to go so far as to also be the freedom of propaganda, the freedom of insurrection, the freedom of treason, the freedom of lying, the freedom of lots of potentially bad things. Do we want to protect them? And that is an American discussion and one that is going on. That gives you a context. This is a problem that happens throughout the world. Many, many countries go through these things on a regular basis, often on a cyclical basis. And the United States had it happen, but not for a long time. We haven't had a major attempt at insurrection since the 1860s. So well over 100 years, closer to 150 years, actually a little bit more than that, since the last major insurrection. So that's a pretty good cycle life. But but it's important to understand that this is the American context. Now, when we look at Nicaragua, where we are here, we could basically tell the exact same story, only it happened a couple years before, literally just a few, about three and a half years earlier. 
And basically all the things I said were exactly the same. So this is something that happens in a lot of places. It just happens to be that I'm an American and I live in Nicaragua and I hear, but what's interesting is in the United States, you don't hear people talking about uh, that people who committed insurrection, people that were involved in attempting to overthrow the government, people who are attempting to subvert democracy, that their arrests or their uh, uh, legal processes are something that should warn other people from visiting the United States. If anything, people would say, well, you know, insurrections happen and yes, that we don't know exactly what should happen to them, but we're pretty, pretty sure that the government should arrest them. Right. We're pretty like if you were visiting the United States and they said, no, they're letting them out on the streets, you'd be like, wow, that's nuts. I don't want people who are taking up arms and just attacking to try to overthrow other people's right to vote out on the streets. So that they're being arrested is very logically a good thing. That is not a process that you want to have. Once you have that process, you're just looking for mayhem, right? You just arm everyone, attack anyone. Where do, where do you go, right? No, we're not going to allow for a vote, right? It was literally an attack on the voters. So here in Nicaragua, however, there are also, in theory, people who get arrested. Now, one thing is very clear is that in the United States, we have this concept of freedom of speech, and it's, it's very much promoted. And so the idea that you can get up and preach insurrection, while it's not clearly allowed, it's also not clearly disallowed. And so you get into a gray area. And so you have a lot of people who get up and call for insurrection all the time, and generally nothing happens to them, or extremely little happens to them. But it's also important to note that one of the reasons that the United States is so adamant about freedom of speech is that there's also no effective speech in America. You can't get up, call for insurrection, and have any large number of people listen to you. That's not normal. The ability to control media outlets and uh, to control mass media, social media uh, outlets like TikTok and Google and, and or, uh, um, Facebook and things like that are really big. The United States government has the ability to manipulate things online through many, many different channels channels and are able to take the idea of freedom of speech and use it to control the populace. And so it's actually a tool to keep the value of free speech from becoming the ability to dramatically influence the government. Of course, it influences it some, but it doesn't have the UK. You just can't write a great speech, get up and change how the US government works. That would never happen. In many other countries, and Nicaragua is a great example, freedom of speech is not a guaranteed thing. That's not a right that people just have. Just like in France and Europe, right? Europe feels in general that freedom of speech would run against the ability to have an effective democracy because freedom of speech risks protecting the attempt to overthrow democracy. It protects, in theory, uh, influences by outside powers. And these are things we have to worry about, right? In both cases, U.S. and Nicaragua, the, the protests that they had that turned into something more were backed by foreign governments with, obviously, interests that were not in alignment with the people of those countries. So there's so much similarity between these. It's, it's really amazing. But now, okay, so that gives us a context. So we expect that uprisings and political activism will happen. That's going to happen in every country everywhere. From time to time, it's cyclical. We know that governments need to protect people from that happening, especially in democracies. Because in any democratic country, you have to have the ability to shut down armed uprising or armed uprising will immediately subvert the vote. Why bother voting if the people who scream loudest and threaten the most will always just take power? You have to use the power of democracy to enforce that democracy or it will simply vanish within very short time. So every country that has any form of democracy also knows it has to make the vote sacred. The results have to be defended. Now, if you defend them well, you don't have to do too much in most cases, right? The United States has been able to go 150 years without having to seriously shut down any attempt to physically undermine uh, the vote. So yeah, you have to be ready to defend it, but being really ready to defend it, this is a very American thing, but it's, it's generally true. The ability to defend it makes it less likely for it to be a thing you have to defend, right? Because people don't see it as a weak link in the chain. When, and then we then accept that in order to have reasonable law and order in your country, you must then arrest and prosecute people who do those things. And maybe they can have a good excuse. They didn't understand, they didn't whatever, that's for the courts. And you can argue about the efficacy of the court system separately, but you must be in a position 
to have punishments for people who try to steal the vote away from the people, right? And that's what an insurrection is in a democracy, right? We have a vote, that vote is now being honored, and then someone says, I don't like the results of that vote, I'm going to take up arms and try to take the rights, the voting rights, the democracy rights from all the other people. That's something that people don't talk about very much, but that is the action that we're actually discussing. Governments are a reflection, d democratic governments are the reflection of the will of the people. So when people are taking up arms and trying to change that government, not through the vote, you're talking about negating the votes, right? Oh, look, I know all my neighbors voted one way, but I've got, I've got weapons or a louder voice, or I'm just willing to be more violent, and I'm going to take their rights away and put the person in charge of them that I want because I can, right? That's, that's basically what individuals are saying. It is an attack on every person who wants the right to be represented in the country because that's what they're trying to take away. Oh, no, we know that you were represented. We didn't like what that representation was because it's not what I was, so I'm going to take it away. Okay, so what we have now in the United States, we know ongoing there are trials uh, and, and arrests and incarcerations of people who were involved in those actions. What we hear, so we know that's true, we assume that is true in Nicaragua. I do not have the insight into Nicaragua to know that that is absolutely true. I assume it's true. I'm told it by all kinds of people. I have no reason to believe it's not true. And it certainly would be bad if it wasn't true. So we assume that it is true. Now, all that is context about how countries work and stuff. Let's talk about the very specific thing that people are being told. And then let's apply what we just learned from context to that. When people are looking to move down to Nicaragua, there is a very high likelihood that this or something very, very close to it will happen, will be said to them. At some point, you will be contacted by people who claim that they live in Nicaragua. It's always someone who's attempting to use the fact that they exist in Nicaragua and have firsthand knowledge of things going on that they reach out to you and give you this warning. And the warning seems to be pretty ubiquitous. That's the exact same thing being said many times. I've heard this from so many different people, it's always exactly in the same way, and always from someone who is stating that they're here in country. And in all the times that I've questioned, there's plenty of times that I've not dug into it, but in all the times that I have dug into who said this to you, it always ended up being someone hiding behind anonymous accounts and could not verify. No one could verify. No one could even find anything beyond their own claim that they were in Nicaragua at all. There's every reason to believe that all or the majority of the people that are making these statements are one, not in Nicaragua at all. Two, may have never been to or even know where Nicaragua is. Three, easily are not humans. They are very easily bots somewhere. There's no reason to get a human involved. This is a very cheap thing you can do with AI if you are a large state and you want to discourage people from moving to another country. We already know places like the United States, but also Germany, UK, basically every major country, maintain something like the State Department travel advisory list. Everybody's a little bit different, but they all have them. And they generally use that not to warn their citizens about what is safe and what is dangerous, but to suggest that they vacation places that they have friendly relationships with and try to steer people away from places that they would like to hurt economically. Whether it's good or bad for you is generally irrelevant to the agencies who are making those lists. That's a very important thing to understand, but it's also important to understand that those agencies, especially of first world countries, have so many resources financially and so much to gain from even small efforts on their part to towards steering people that using simple tools whether it's a small call center of just lower income people that they're able to throw at this job it's a great job for someone who just wants to chat online during the day or throwing ai at it for basically for free because they own the resources to a lot of these things and they make taxes from third-party private ones they have so many ways that it's essentially free for them to use ai to do this that they can just put those tools to work and have them reach out and every person who is looking for more information on Nicaragua, as an example, can be completely inundated by a cohesive 
well thought out, well planned set of stories that may come at them from many different directions. They'll find random websites saying it. They'll find Reddit articles on it where it's like a back and forth. They'll find someone who sends them a note on Facebook or whatever. And none of these things can actually be verified as being real. You have no idea if any of them are actually real people at all. And yet when you take them all together and they seem to come from so many different directions and so many different medias and formats, it will feel like you must be talking to at least a large number of legitimate people. Any given one might be fake, but they can't all be fake, can they? And the reality is, is that the amount of effort it would take for all of them to be fake is so trivial that it's, it's actually shocking that anyone would think that there was any effort behind it. Like it's really that easy. But I just went through this with my own team, my own team that does security all the time got fooled, nothing bad happened, but someone got an, an, an email or a phone call from someone claiming to work for a vendor that made no sense. Like that vendor would never be allowed to contact us. We would never accept email. None of the things they said added up, like not a single thing they said made sense. And yet they said enough things and said it in such a way that they passed on the information. Of course, we deleted it immediately. But it really is easy to manipulate people, especially when we're used to thinking, well, I heard someone's voice, I saw their face, they must be real, that's generally the case. And when you do it online, our brains are still wired to feel like we spoke to them in person, when in reality, we don't know if we're just talking to a robot somewhere. So that's really important that in these cases, we've never once determined that there's a real person that we're talking to, or if they are a real people, person, that the things that they're saying are, are true, rather than them just repeating a script. Call centers reading scripts, that's how everyone does everything in call centers, right? And that the, you're getting the exact same wording from place after place after place after place. It is super clear when you're on my side and talk to a lot of people, that is the same thing being repeated. Uh, they're all running from a playbook, right? So this is what happens. They reach out and they say, oh, Nicaragua is beautiful. There's all these great things, but you know, they're detaining people who speak out against the government and they're being arrested. And so it's really dangerous. You shouldn't come. So let's, let's really, and that's how simple the statement is. So let's dig into this. One, are, is this even true? Are people being arrested for speaking out against the government? That may be true. But what I don't know is if it is true. I do not know of anyone who has directly spoken out against the government and been arrested. I do know firsthand of people that I know personally who called for insurrection in a public forum where they not just did something, calling for insurrection is illegal in Nicaragua. In the United States, it is probably illegal, but it is a gray area currently. In Nicaragua, it is not a gray area. It is illegal. So anyone doing this knows they're committing a crime. And, but, but discussing politics is not, right? That's different. Calling for insurrection is a crime in just about every country you can imagine, right? There's very few places where that's not a crime. So you always assume that's a crime. And we're talking about locals. We're not talking about foreigners. That, that would be obviously a crime. And then doing so in a public forum where they have to be licensed to have a performance. And so I'm sure there's other cases, but every case that I am aware of firsthand is that they were not arrested for speaking out against the government. They're arrested for calling for insurrection in violation of a license. And then the story says that they are arrested. Well, that's that. Okay. I've been arrested for having fireworks in New York. I've been arrested for going too fast when driving. And yes, I did something wrong in both cases, or at least where wrong is against the law. You can argue whether it's wrong ethically or not, but it was illegal in those cases. And I was arrested. Imagine if foreign, you know, governments were taking my story of having set off fireworks in Ithaca, New York, one evening during the 3rd of July. It was one day early for the 4th of July. And I was arrested. I was thrown on a hood of a cop car. I was read my Miranda rights. Oh, and they talk about how you just you go to jail and it, you get arrested. And they use all these terms. And the reality was, is I got yelled at by the cops. They did not throw me in the back of the cop car. They did not take me to jail. I was not a threat to society. They didn't go too far overboard. They did read me my Miranda rights. They did say, you're being arrested. They, you know, that was big and scary. And then they gave me a piece of paper and told me when to appear in court. And I went and appeared in court. And then the judge laid into the cops for wasting the court's resources over something that clearly should not have been something I would be arrested over. While it was overly dramatic, the system also responded on my behalf. So you could spin that as someone telling the story that all you have to do is take some fireworks, which is something every little kid does every day here in Nicaragua is go out and set off fireworks. But if they were in New York, getting arrested for that would be an extremely common occurrence. So you can tell this story to Nicaraguans. Oh, did you know if your kids were doing this in New York, they'd just be picked up by the cops? And that's true. 
But we also know not to respond to that in a, wow, it's such a police state in, in New York. It's clearly not, right? So that's, it just doesn't make sense in that way, but it's really easy to spin that story. So in reverse, we're hearing this story about Nicaraguans. Okay, so are they arresting people? Well, if people are being involved in insurrection, then you could tell that story about the United States. And yes, they are being arrested in the United States. They're also being arrested here, we assume. One difference, though, is in the United States, every person who's being arrested is given one option, right? Go to jail. That seems to be the only option being, being given. So in this situation, people who are arrested and sent to prison, they just have to stay. What's happening in Nicaragua that we know of is that some people who are sent to prison, and we don't actually know they're sent to prison, they may just be in jail. I know those are almost the same, but they're not exactly the same. When they're in jail, they are sometimes given the option to get out of jail, and instead of serving their sentence, that they can simply leave the country, I assume, with some promise of not coming back or not coming back for a long time. In all the cases that I've heard of, that I know anything about, the people in question are multinational, so they have the right to be somewhere else. And of course, if you're multinational, it kind of puts you into a weird position if you're getting involved in anything that involves insurrection or anything of the sort, because it starts to make you, well, are you working on behalf of your other government? Are you thinking as someone who, and this is important, if you are a single uh, a passport holder, the country that you're voting for, the country that you're interested in, that represents you. You are trapped with your own decisions. If you vote for something terrible, that affects you. You can't get away from it. But if you're a multi-passport holder or you're in a position where you can just move to another country, it's very easy to be like, well, I'm going to vote for just an experiment. And if anything goes wrong, I'll just walk away, leave the problems with you. Or to say, well, I really want something bad to happen to this country because I can also go live over here and I want to do good things for them by harming these people. The idea of democracy really only functions well when everyone is trapped with the decisions that they make. Now, generally, dual passport holders are a very tiny percentage of any given population, so it doesn't normally become too much of a problem, but it does come up in these circumstances that there are a lot of people who are representing potentially multiple interests and are involved in uh, these activities and then being given an option to simply return to the other country and give up time or maybe even their passports in this one. Now, that is an option. No one that I've heard stories of, I've heard absolutely no suggestion, even by foreign governments, that it is anything more than an option. No one is being deported. That is not the term going on. It is offering people the opportunity to leave. Imagine if you lived in Pennsylvania, you committed a crime, and Pennsylvania said, okay, you're going to jail for the next 10 years. Or you can optionally go to Ohio and we won't see you again. You're not allowed to come back. And most people will say, I don't really want to go to jail. I'm sorry I got caught. Living in Ohio sounds better than living in prison. I know some of you would say maybe it's not, but we'll assume that at least it sounds better at the time. So a lot of people, almost everyone who is given this option, once they're facing having already been found guilty of whatever it is that we're talking about, that then they're going to take any option they can to get out of prison and Going to the country often that they are acting on behalf of makes just a lot of sense. So in many cases, when people are talking about the horrible punishments that may be enacted on someone, that horrible punishment is having to go to the United States. If you hear anyone talking about how much they wish there weren't so many immigrants coming to the United States, you have to ask them, well, it's weird because we seem to hear these stories together. It's hard to know for sure. They are. But some people are saying everybody wants to come to the U.S. And it feels like the same people are then turning around and saying the greatest punishment you can imagine is being sent to the United States. It doesn't really add up. Even if we're looking at different people, the stories of the good and the bad are so at odds and just don't logically make sense. So this gives us an important background on what is happening. But now let's talk about does it matter to you? So this is where it starts to get even more interesting. The people who are saying you can't come because it's too dangerous are saying that because a person who lives in the United States or lives in Nicaragua and has taken it upon themselves to be involved in insurrection against their own country and then faces a legal system that follows what you would expect and want under normal circumstances a country to do uh, and is then uh, incarcerated for their actions and in the a situation in Nicaragua, perhaps given the really lenient option of not having to serve that sentence if they don't want to, and just returning to whatever country they have the option to go to. So that's what we're talking about as the thing that could happen. So if that's your, your fear, 
How does that apply to an expat or a tourist who's going to come to a country who, one, is not that person, two, is not planning on staying for the rest of their lives, three, is not a passport holder looking at possibly losing their passport, four, not here to commit crimes, we assume, it doesn't make any sense to mention this in the context of the safety of someone who's coming here. None of it, not just part of it, but absolutely none of it applies unless your intent is to come here as a criminal. Are they suggesting that they think you're a criminal who is going to act on behalf of a foreign government and try to come here and wage a personal war against democracy? And then you could say the same thing in reverse. Is someone going to the United States with that intent? And would it be then warned against that it's not safe to go there? Well, of course, if you're planning on committing a really serious crime in a country, that would be potentially potentially unsafe. However, what we have seen here in Nicaragua is that the generally worst case scenario, other than the incredibly painful process of sitting through your court hearing and being yelled at, being put into the newspaper, is that at the end of the day, if you were to not come to Nicaragua, let's say you're American, you start in the United States and you don't come to Nicaragua. At the end of the day, you're stuck in the United States. If you were to come to Nicaragua, it seems like if you were to commit these crimes, which are serious crimes and make no sense for you to be involved in, but if you were to do so, that the most likely outcome is that you'd be sent back and be in exactly the same position you had been if you hadn't come to Nicaragua at all. It's hard to describe that scenario as being unsafe when you're looking at it relative to where you started. If the United States is the greatest possible, possible punishment that someone can imagine, then starting in the United States is already the worst case scenario according to what seems to be a lot of people's propaganda about Nicaragua. And the one thing they're most fearful of is that you would end up, you poor thing, eventually being sent to the United States. What a horrible punishment that is. You would think no immigrant would ever want to go to the United States given the incredible horrors that people seem to associate with having been sent there as an option compared to going to prison. If you were in such a bad situation, then even just getting a few months of living in Nicaragua to commit your crimes would certainly be the highlight of your life if the United States is that incredible punishment. None of it adds up. So we assume you are not coming here to commit crimes. None of this applies to you. And it seems really disingenuous for someone to take something so bizarre and to use it as a warning as to why you shouldn't come, why it would be dangerous for you. Similarly, if you were to say, you know, bank robbers were caught and they went to jail and you shouldn't come because if you were to rob a bank, you could go to jail. Well, OK, is, is that really the kind of threat that we feel is such a concern? Do we feel are we suggesting that the countries are coming from? You can commit crimes like that and you don't have to worry about going to jail or right, like none of it adds up. And then. Lastly, the, this is really interesting. The people who are saying this are claiming in every case that I know of that they have chosen Nicaragua, that they have the option to be somewhere else, that they have moved here, made a life, have decided that all these things don't matter to them, that this is still the place that they would choose above all others because they, like me, they being fake, I'm sure, but like me, I make a conscious decision every day to wake up and I say, hello, Nicaragua, do I want to stay here today? And my answer consistently is yes. Sometimes I have work and I have to go places, but this is a place I choose. I am not trapped here. I have the ability to leave and I was just gone last week, right? I could have not come back. That's an option. I passed through several wonderful countries while I was traveling. I could have stayed any number of really nice places, but I was in a hurry to get back to my home here in Nicaragua. All of us who live here, and I'm not saying that Nicaragua is the right answer for everyone, of course not, and we all know that's not true, but for a great number of people, we are coming here and we make the choice that whether it's because it's safe or, or inexpensive or the weather is beautiful or we like the people, we like the food, we just love the house that we found or whatever, whatever mix of things Nicaragua is offering us is the thing that makes us choose this. And so these people are saying that they've evaluated their options, which are numerous to be sure, and said Nicaragua is the one that is the whatever right for them, the, at the result at the end of the day is that they've chosen Nicaragua to come here and they have chosen to stay and they continue to choose to stay. But even having done so, they're without knowing you, warning you that it's too dangerous for you, not explaining why it's safe for them and why it would be dangerous for you, especially given that they give examples that are not dangerous to anyone normal and make no sense whatsoever. It's all pretty disingenuous, layer after layer of disingenuous. But the way that it's presented, the way that it's stated, the way that you hear it in the United States makes people have this reaction. Oh, it feels like something bad is happening. But is something bad happening? Well, no. Everything we've described is something good, at least if you aren't into really harsh punishments for things. You can 
can make a really strong argument that Nicaragua is way too lenient on people who have been involved in uprisings or insurrections, allowing them to simply go back to another country and not serve out their sentences, feels like maybe they're not doing enough to shut down uh, these types of activities through a certain amount of fear. The United States would never simply send, they would incarcerate them until the end of their incarceration and then deport them every single time if they didn't just send them off to Guantanamo Bay and make them disappear. So this is a level of leniency that, yes, you can make a strong argument that you worry that the level of leniency will not do enough to discourage future uprisings. And that's a whole incarceration theory of, you know, criminal justice and stuff. I am not in any way qualified. I can tell you this is the thought process as to why you may find it concerning or not concerning. But what I can tell you is, is that leniency likely statistically to cause good things, bad things? Who knows? Like, I just don't know. But that is where you can make an argument. But all the rest of it, all the actions are exactly what we would want, what we need if we want to live in a safe place, if we want in our own country, like me from the United States, for example, if they were not to prosecute those people, they would be stating that rising up and attempting to take away our democracy is allowed. And that's not okay. As a voter, that's not okay. Trying to knowing that other people can grab weapons or, you know, get up on a pulpit and scream, pulpit being, you know, in public, not, not, <laughs> not referring to churches, and scream that we shouldn't be listened to, that our vote should be ignored, that, that our freedoms and our voice should be taken by force. So aren't things that are okay. They're not ethically okay. They're not morally okay. They're not, they're not democratically okay, right? And they're not okay as a citizen of your country. So if that happened in the United States, and it did, we would be appalled. Every voter would know it was an attack on them if the government and the legal system didn't prosecute those people. To the Nicaraguan people, it must feel exactly the same way. If they don't have the law come down on those people, they're being told that, well, why bother voting if someone can just grab weapons and that's what gets the voice? Why, why vote on paper when you can vote with lead? And so it's really important that we recognize that everything that people are describing as what's happening is incredibly good and exactly what we want and exactly a copy or the first of, because it happened first, of what's going on in the United States. Neither country is doing something bad in this case. We're not comparing one to be like, oh, it's better than the other. No, they're doing basically the exact same thing. The United States is being less lenient once you've been found guilty. Nicaragua is being more lenient and that's a great gray area that you can argue over and feel free to get in the comments and argue over that. Personally, I'm going to side with the U.S. on this one. I prefer a little bit less lenient on something this dramatic. I think that Nicaragua probably, in my personal opinion, is going too far in letting people off the hook by simply sending them back wherever they came from. That's, uh, that's a good way to encourage other people to come and take risks of disrupting things. But that is their decision, not mine, and none of it at the end of the day is up to me, nor does it directly affect me. I get to live in the place I choose and I have the right to leave should I want to, but that freedom is something that I have and I am thankful that the country allows me to come here and that's really important. So at the end of the day, this is a, a tactic that we see repeated time and time again and almost all of you who are seriously looking at moving to anywhere like this that you're probably going to hear statements like this made and it's easy to hear them like marketing and to just jump to they must be telling me something bad they must be telling me something that's a real warning but when you actually break it down you realize they actually described something very good and they explained why it made no sense and they actually told me by their action of living here by choosing to have come and choosing to remain they're telling me that the important thing is that this is where they would recommend you recommend where you are Right. Unless you have some delta to work from. Oh, you live in a different your family's in a different time zone. You speak a different language. Well, I choose this for me. But because you speak this other language, I would recommend this for you. OK, I can do that. But when you, the strongest recommendation you can give for a place is where you choose to remain. So if they're choosing to remain in Nicaragua, they've told you beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is the place they would choose if it was their decision, because it is their decision. And they did. So you can't have them claim some other thing. And when you look at it from that that context, it's easy to see that clearly they are trying to trick you. And we don't know why. We don't know what's funding that. We don't know what, what's causing that. But we know that they're not being genuine. And that fear is purely the result of some group of people who want to do damage. Someone who's either trying to steer you to get your money. Someone who's trying to hurt someone else. We don't know why. But we know that it's happening.
Thanks for joining me. Like and subscribe. If you'd like to help support the channel, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. As always, that comes directly to me and helps make this possible and my travels and my cameras and all those things. I hope that this was a good episode for you guys. I know that it's a Friday afternoon and you're ready to go into the weekend and this isn't the happiest of topics, but sometimes we have to cover this because these things come up too often and we need to point to these videos and point someone to these videos. When someone says, hey, I heard, point them to this. Have them sit down. When you get news, use some logic, tear it apart, use, use serious reasoning. Quite often, if we actually read what's in the news, rather than listening to the tone, but look at the words, the things they can't deny when we say, well, this event didn't happen, they tend to paint a very different picture than the tone of the news that is used. Tone is allowed to steer you, but you can't falsify the facts without getting caught. You can't catch someone for using the wrong tone. Share on social media, tell your friends about the show, and I will see all of you tomorrow. Once I've done my due diligence, four videos should pop up on the screen. Pick one and they'll tell the algorithm you want more of this.